Hello and welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet and today I'm at an icon of the uh, single malt scotch whiskey industry. It's the Glenfarclas distillery. Glenfarclas is located here in the Speyside and Glenfarclas means valley of the green grass. So if you look around it's already fall so the the bushes and the trees are turning yellow and brown but still the the grass is really really green and so yeah it is truly the valley of the green grass so at the back you see the hills the hills of the ben Rinnes. you can actually not see the peak from here but uh, it's it's the hillside of the ben Rinnes, and that's where the distillery gets their water from there's a creek flowing down and that supplies the distillery with fresh water. Let's talk about, a bit about the history of the Glenfarclas distillery. It was founded in 1836 and by founded I mean registered. So they got registered in 1836, they got a legal distilling license, but um, they were distilling way before that illegally. And that means um, we really don't know when um, Mr. Hay found the distillery and when they started the distilling business. Um, what was really, really important was that John Grant bought the distillery. The Grant family is now in the sixth generation um, of the uh, distillery. So it's really a family business and it's a generational family business. And these people really think about a few generations ahead. They, they produce whiskey that they never gonna taste because they produce it for their sons and grandsons or daughters for that sake. So John bought the distillery. And then in the 1950s, the fourth, um, this um, generation, George Grant, um, George S. Grant, he was very, very important for the distillery and even the whiskey industry because the whiskey industry back in the time, if you know that, um, was dominated by blends. So the big names within the industry were blend whiskies and they always bought um, their malt whiskey from distilleries like Glen Farkless. They bought casks and then mixed them together to get the blend that they wanted. But um, as some styles are, are a bit similar and taste profiles varied a bit, so these uh, distilleries could be interchanged very easily. And that means that the, the price competition was very high for these distilleries. So they were barely making any money, they were barely getting by. And so he thought, George thought, um, why don't we sell the, the, the whiskey as a single malt whiskey? The whiskey is much better as a single malt anyway. We don't need that grain part. So he marketed Glen Farkless as a single malt whiskey. Didn't sell that many casks to the blend industry anymore. And many people laughed at him and thought, oh, that will never work. He will get bankrupt within a decade. Um, but he persisted, he did it, and it actually worked. So he got much, much better margins for the new single malt whiskey. And um, John, uh, Glenn Farkless was actually a name to be recognized within the industry. And what that actually means for us today is he didn't have to give out that many casks and it wasn't sold as cheap liquor and just wasted but the the casks still remain a few in the warehouses so Glen Farkless really has a good amount of old casks within their warehouses and you can see that in let's say the family cask series where there are really really old casks that can be filled as single cask bottlings. So that was the fourth generation um, that unfortunately already passed away. Now we are within the fifth generation with uh, John and then the sixth generation with George again and they actually do lead the uh, distillery 
and they manage it really, really well. As they are a family business, as I mentioned before, they think ahead. They're not influenced that much by the, the fluctuation within the whiskey market where whiskey is now in a, in a boom cycle and maybe it goes into a bit of a recession in the future. So they keep persisting and they, they think ahead in decades, not in just month or quarter of a year or something like that. So yeah, it's a really nice family business. Let's see how the Glen Farkless whiskey is made. The good whiskey production always starts with two ingredients, water and malt. Water we've already talked about, but now let's talk about the malt. The malt is delivered here by truck, so it's being malted somewhere else and it is 100% barley. And then we have to actually filter the malt, because sometimes there can be any, some stuff inside the malt that you don't want. This is done by the malt dresser. It's a tumble and you have the centrifugal effect and that sorts out any lighter materials, any straws, any small branches or anything like that is being taken out of the pure malt. But still, there is some stuff left inside the malt. The heavier materials. This here is the de-stoner. It sorts out any stones. But before that, you see here is a conveyor belt and it has a plate actually bolted onto it. And on that plate is a strong magnet and that takes any magnetic metal, metal parts out of the malt. After that, it goes into the de-stoner. And the de-stoner is basically a very jumpy thing that, uh, that lets the, the malt jump. All the lighter malt goes to the front and the heavier stones go to the back. And here you can see what they get out of the de-stoner. You really don't want to have these stones inside your malt mill. The malt mill is then a roller mill installed in the 70s and they make a really coarse grist. And you can see that here. You have some flour in there, really grind down starch. Then you have the, the grits, like little bits of starch that stick together and then you have the husks, the outside part of the malt. And when you've done a coarse grist, the malt is ready for the next production step. Behind me is the enormous match ton of Glen Farkless. It has a capacity of 16,000 kilograms of grist and it is mixed with water and then filled in here. You can see it's steaming out and in the mash tun, the water dilutes the sugar and the starches and then you end up with a very, very sugary and sweet starchy substance that's called the mash. And the mash is um, the stuff that is the base for the fermentation. You have uh, a semi lauder ton, so you have two kind of washings. The first washing and the second washing produce um, a sheer amount of 83,000 liters of mash, of this sugary substance that then goes to the fermentation. There is a, a third um, mashing going on, which produces a very lightly sweet um, sugary substance, which can't be used for the fermentation. So it's stored in a separate tank, and then this water is used in the next cycle because it you still don't want to lose any sugar and any starches. Even though they have such an enormous mash ton, they do something special with it because they do it a bit slower than usual. The, each mashing takes an enormous time of 11 hours, which is very long for an industry standard. And after we are off with this very sugary substance, we see how that stuff goes into the alcoholic fermentation. The mash tun is really, really big. So therefore, the distillery has to split 
one mash tun into two wash bags. They actually have 12 wash bags and they're being filled simultaneously. After they filled them to quite a level, they stop and then they add the yeast. So one is being filled, the other one gets the yeast, then this one stops and the other one gets the yeast. The yeast has to be added really precisely. If you have not enough yeast, then the fermentation is not fast enough, strong enough, then you will not add, end up with a good wash. If you add too much yeast, the yeast goes really fast, gets really hot, dies, you don't get a good yeast. So the, the amount of yeast they have to add here, you have to be really, really precise. The other thing that they can change the, the uh, flavor profile of the wash is by controlling the speed of the fermentation and the duration. So the duration with 72 hours is actually really, really long. And that means that they have a very fruity flavor. The fruity characters come in the, the late stages of the fermentation where you ha of already have all the alcoholic fermentation, but you get more of a fruity character. So in the end, you don't get any more value as in more alcohol, but you do get more value as in flavor. The other thing is the speed of the fermentation. That is really, so not solely, but mainly defined by the temperature of the, the wash. And the temperature of the wash has two factors, the outside temperature and the initial temperature. The outside temperature is defined by yeah, the weather, and the weather here in Scotland can be very cold in winter and very hot in the summer, and no, mildly hot in the summer. And so in the winter, they actually have, a, have the mash that comes from the mash tun a bit warmer than they have it in the winter, uh, in the summer. So the, the mash tun heats it up to 70, 80, 90 degrees Celsius, and then they cool it down. And they are now in, in fall, they're at about 19, 19.5 degrees Celsius, what, what they use as their filling. Uh, initial temperature. So the warmer is outside, the cooler they fill it into the fermentation tank. And that's how they get the consistency of the flavor profile all over the year. After they have fermented the mash, they end up with a wash that it has about 9% alcohol, depending a bit on the natural product that was used. So um, after they have this 9%, it goes off to the distillation. So I'm in the center, the hard piece of the distillery. It's the stills room. And right next to me is one of the six pot stills. It's one of the three wash stills that Glenn Farkless has. It has a capacity of 26,500 liters and therefore is the biggest stills in the space side. And what is very, very special about Glen Farkless is they are very traditional. They have direct firing. Means there is a gas burner below the wash still and that heats up the, the cattle. And that also means that when you have bits within the wash from the mashing, then you could actually have them fall to the, to the floor and the floor is very, very hot. It's really, really hot in here. And uh, it could actually burn. So there is an old method that prevents that. You have a shaft that is uh, propelling a propeller inside and on the arms of these propellers, there are chains, actually copper chains. And these chains are being turned around in the still clockwise. And that prevents anything from sticking to the bottom. And also it's mixing the whole mash and the whole boiling kettle a lot. So that prevents it from burning and if you'd have burning you'd have some unwanted flavors and you don't want that. So we have the biggest pot stalls in the market and we have uh, uh, the Romangas with direct firing. Now let's have a look at the second distillation. The second distillation is in the smaller spirit still. A spirit still is very important for the flavor of the whiskey. The spirit still shape is defining how the whiskey, how the alcoholic fumes are separated 
and therefore very much defining the character of the spirit. Here we do have a very, very big reflux bowl. The reflux bowl is actually yeah, making reflux. So vortexes and everything that's twisting and turning in there with the alcoholic fumes. And that means the alcohol doesn't just rise to the top and immediately get condensed so they can separate much better, which gives you a finer spirit and a bit lighter, a bit more floral, a bit more fruity. And the second part of the reflux bowl is the increased surface area. The alcoholic fumes stick to the copper plating on the walls of the kettle and they have catalytic reactions going on with the copper and that's the reason why we use copper because of these catalytic reactions. With the increased surface area of the reflux bowl, we have more of these catalytic reactions, therefore also a finer and more gentle spirit that comes out of the spirit still. So if you define the character of the Glenfarclas distillery, of their raw spirit, then it's really a, a nice, gentle, space-side malt whiskey. Behind me is the filling store of Glen Farkless. It's a very, very traditional filling store. You can see the big tank that is being filled with a new make spirit. And then the casks are being filled automatically up to the very, very top. But they don't even put a, a barcode on it. So what they do is they have stencils and then they have paint. So they paint everything on the casks. They are pre-painted with a number and a uh, year and uh, John and George Grant, Glenn Farkless, Belinda Loch. But what they actually have to write on that cask as well is the amount that they fill into the cask. So the machine counts how many liters go into the cask and then they have a separate stencil they use to roll on the exact amount that is uh, filled into the casks. A lot of the flavor profile of a Glen Farkless whiskey comes from the maturation. And here the, the Glen Farkless maturation is pretty atypical. You have 38 warehouses, they're all dunnage, and they barely have any bourbon casks in there. And that's because the Glen Farkless core range is not made with bourbon casks. So they all use Oloroso sherry casks. When you look down there, you see a lot of sherry butts, but there are also smaller casks there. And that means that they use hogsheads. Hogsheads are casks that are disassembled and then reassembled again, which give you a bit of a 250 liter casks. 60% of the core range is matured in first and second fill, and the rest is then in the third and fourth fill. And after the fourth fill, you can't really use the cask because all the flavors are out of the wood. But the very interesting thing is that you have so many old casks. And that's what I mentioned in the intro, in the history, that George S., the fourth generation, in the 50s and 60s, he stored away many casks, didn't sell them to the blends industry, didn't want to make a quick buck, but actually stored them here for his son or his grandson now to harvest them and have a really good old Glen Farkless family cask. So, yeah, that was it with the production. And let's head on then to an interview. So that was it with the production. And now let's have a try of a bit of the core range of Glen Farkless. I'm sitting here with uh, Deborah Stewart. You were in the whiskey business since you were 18. Absolutely. So a lot of experience there. Thank you very much for having us here. Thank you uh, very much for showing us around and showing us the whole distillery. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> OK. so. Um, Lovely day, bit of a Scottish weather here. <laughs> <laughs> mixed, I think, is the, is the answer to that one, mixed. Mixed, yeah, but we had some, some nice time. We Nicer than it looked first thing, that's for sure. <laughs> now it's a bit kind of horizontal rain, but... Yeah, mm, yeah but, but it, it, it's supposed to be get better in a few hours. <laughs> it's all part of the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Scotland in, in fall, but yeah, it's nice. So you've worked for this company now for a year? Or almost two. Almost two years? Yeah. So how is it to work for a family company like the Grand family? It's great. I mean, 
as, as you mentioned, I've been doing this for quite a few years now, but the last company I worked for was much more corporate, shall we say, not okay. naming <laughs> any names. And to work for a family, it just makes things so much easier because you don't have to spend hours and hours and hours working on a PowerPoint presentation to convince them to do something. If you tell them why you want to do it and they think it's a good idea, you do it. Okay, um, you nice. don't have weeks or months to wait to get answers because you see the owners every day. So that's really nice. Okay, so you just drive by or you have the office next to Well, next I, I share an office with young George Grant, so the sixth generation. He's, he's my direct boss as a sales director. Mm -hmm. um, and any day his dad is around, we see John as well. So we see him most days. He, sometimes he does travel, but if he's around, we see him. Okay, and they, they are two Scotsmen. Absolutely. Very <laughs> much what I would describe as Scottish country gentlemen. Scottish they like country their, gentlemen. They like their tweed and they like to, to shoot pheasants and you know that kind of thing. But that's quite typical for this part of but, the country. But they're not greedy Scotsmen. Oh, absolutely not, no. Um, they are typical Scotsmen in that if something's important, then there's no limits. Okay. Um, if something matters, then money doesn't. But that doesn't mean they don't pay attention to, to what's going out and what's coming in. Okay, yeah, they, they should be as... as it's a said, business, it, absolutely. It's a business in the end. So, um, Grand Farkless, let's, let's start off. What are we having today? So, we've taken a few of our core range. We do have quite a large core range different products available in different markets. Mm -hmm. um, the four that we've chosen to try today, the 10, 15, 21 and 105, um, are probably the, the best known, I would say, here in Europe. Mm -hmm. If you were to go to the States, they don't get really the 10 year old, they definitely don't get the 15 year old, but they do get much more of a 12 year old and also a 17 year old, which we don't sell so much of here in Europe. So we do have small variations in the range depending on where we I are. I think you world. used to sell the 17 in Europe. We still do a little bit, a little bit um, okay. but it's not the one we focus on for Europe. But mm -hmm. So the 105 is international? 105 is international. Um, however, don't be confused if you ever do see it in the US and the bottle is dark, like the bottle of the 15 and 21 year old. That's just oh, a, little, okay. a little strange. So we, so we go with age and then 105? 105, yes. Okay. So the cask strength last is always a good idea, I feel. So, 10 year old, which of course is our entry level. This one's been on the market for a good few years now and it's bottled at 40%, which of course is the least amount of alcohol you can have and still call it a whiskey. We don't want mm -hmm. to pay too much tax when we're in our entry level <laughs> product. Um, Unfortunately, of course, the tax does pay a, play a larger part mm -hmm. on uh, a younger whisky. For a 10, I find the 10 very drinkable. I think I find it to be a little bit malty, a little bit fruity. Mm -hmm. It's Some people tend to kind of discount the younger whiskies because mm -hmm. there are lots of 10 year olds on the market. But I find it still got enough to be of interest. Um, of course, it doesn't have the real length of finish you get. We'll get those later, but it does have a lot of sweetness. Mm -hmm. A lot of sweetness, and it's it's a lot of sherry aroma on there. You will get the sherry notes, mm -hmm. even um, so even on ten years old. So, of course, one of the um, mm -hmm. important things here at Glenfarclas is that we never add any kind of colouring to our whiskies. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, it's got a nice colour for a ten year old. Mm -hmm. um, the colour, of course. People tend to fixate a lot on the colour. Um, <laughs> people tend to say, well, if it's a first full sherry cask, then it's going to be really, really dark and that means it's old. Well, no, it really doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a 10-year-old just from a first full sherry cask, it will look the same colour as a 50-year-old, mm -hmm. almost. It depends on the <laughs> cask, of course. Every cask is different. But mm -hmm. we certainly, we compared some in the warehouse the last day and the 15-year-old and the 50-year-old were the same colour. Um, interesting. Because the colour does tend to come in the, over the years. Do you mm. tend to add water to your whiskey? Um, or do you like to try it first? I think we would try it first neat. Mm. Mm. It does have a certain richness to it. Obviously, mm. again, that is something that does come also with the years, but it's there, a little bit of spiciness. Mm -hmm. mm. I would have expected it. Uh, it's it's nice, fruity, but I would have expected much more milder. Okay. And you ha do have that what you said as a richness. Mm -hmm. So um, the the Oloroso casks that we talked about earlier, 
are they all European oak or? It is European oak, yes. Um, but as part of the, the way to get the balance of the product like this, we are using the cask, of course, a few times. Mm -hmm. So um, the first fill, of course, is the one that gives the most of the richness. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes more delicate. So you get mm -hmm. more into the slightly more floral, fruity, lighter notes mm -hmm. on the third or fourth fill. So it's about getting that balance. Yeah, but it's it's quite rich. I, I would have expected more of a fruity light character. This is more of a malty, fruity, yeah. malty, rich. Mm, incredible for a for a 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. We're very lucky. Working here, we get a bottle of this every month. So every <laughs> month, okay. We're popular. We're very, pop very popular with our friends. <laughs> There's always good whiskey in my house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I talked a lot about the 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 family of the Grands. And you know how I have six generations in within the family. So is it progressing? Are we having a next generation at some point? Then? There absolutely will be a next generation. Okay. Um, they're quite young, so we're not saying too much okay. yet about exactly who and what form that's going to take because it's it's too young. They're too young for us to put that kind of pressure on them. One okay, thing sure. I can say for sure okay. is that there will be a change of name. Because <laughs> there's not, not to be George a John, John nor a George, <laughs> um, for the simple reason that George has two girls. Oh, okay. So uh, the next generation will be female. Georgina? So, no, apparently that, was, that name was not even considered. <laughs> um, however, personally, I think that's great. So I've been okay, working sure. in this industry, um, as you mentioned, for a few years, and there's been a lar large change in attitude, I think, towards females in this industry. Even yes, the time I, that I've, I've, worked I've seen there. that there are a lot of master distillers, master blenders. More and more in the production more and more. side as and well. And I've heard that, that females actually do have a good uh, scent of, yep. uh, of sense smell. Of smell. Absolutely. Sense of smell, so there will be more and more coming in. So maybe in, in 50 <laughs> years time it's like, oh, you have a male? Yes, <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> you never it, know. <laughs> it is definitely, I think, I'm not sure how it is in, in Germany. From what I've seen in the festivals and things I've visited, there are certainly it's still a few females who attend, though. Um, yeah, do, there are a few females, but it's still, still male-dominated. More, more, it's definitely still more male, but um, but they're they coming in more and more. So and and the thing is, uh, it's it's not that 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 women tend to have like oh they want to have just the the liqueur or the the very mild one. No, they do actually tend to have the rich ones as well. Absolutely, <laughs> and I I see that myself. Uh, mm -hmm. If I go to a cocktail bar, I tend to be the one that's ordering the kind of because I'm quite straight, an old fashioned or something, and <laughs> okay. um, they they always want to try and serve me the the one that looks like the, the girly one, colada. yeah, the one with the fruits and the flowers coming out of the top. Whereas I'm like, no, no, give me that one that looks like blood and sand, or <laughs> yeah, old fashioned, something along those lines, mm -hmm. whiskey sour. So, um, what's the next one then? The, so next the second one whiskey, cookie? we'll try the fifteen. Mm -hmm. So the fifteen is bottled at 46%, which is quite unusual for our core okay. range. Um, the reason for that is John's father, George, who we refer to now as Old George. Old George said that this, at 15 years, is um, his favourite Glenfarclas, but only if it's at 46%. Mm -hmm. So you asked before what it's like working for a family. Well, one of the things you have to say about working for a family is, if they decide that's how we're doing it, that's how we do it. <laughs> you don't say, really, you sure? You say, absolutely, yes, no problem, of course. <laughs> and it works. So this whiskey has a lot more power compared to the 10. Mm -hmm. And a, a lift in the complexity as well, because mm -hmm. it is a little bit older and a little bit stronger. Mm -hmm. Personally, because I was so young when I started doing this job, I do usually like to put a bit of water in my whiskey because that's how I was taught. Mm -hmm. so Maybe I, I, this one. <laughs> I never drank whiskey without water when I was starting out. Now, it's that kind of what you get used to. Obviously, you can always have more of it. It is 46 rather than 60. So. <laughs> How's that Scottish saying going, never drink whiskey without water and water without whiskey? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I do. Some people who do still believe that the only thing you should add to whiskey is more whiskey. <laughs> 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 no, um, 
of course, we're also part of the, the school that believes that you should drink the whiskey however you like it. Yeah, sure. Um, there's absolutely no point in me telling you you have to do it a certain way. It should be the way you want to drink it. But if you're trying to taste it, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. So how you drink a whiskey and how you taste a whiskey, for me, that's two totally different things. Mm -hmm. um, properly tasting, obviously, water. And of course, we're lucky sitting here because it is the water from, from the spring. Oh, okay, so it's, it's the, the water The real water already. which used to make it. Sorry for those watching at home that don't get that luxury. <laughs> it loses a bit of the spice when you put the water in. Mm -hmm. like it's, spice, it's spicier without it. But it increases in the kind of the, the sweeter direction again. Is it something mm -hmm. like maybe something, something slightly toffee direction? Something of this kind of... Mm -hmm. um, mm. I find it strange as it, maybe it's the water, but um, it's a bit more creamy. Yeah. It still has a, a good amount of richness, but it's uh, creamy and um, a soft fruitiness. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. I like even a bit more fresh fruitiness, ev even as the the other one. But maybe that's the water. It could <laughs> be the water, absolutely. Mm. Mm. I always find it very hard um, to tell people exactly mm -hmm. what they should be tasting mm. because at the end of the day, it's up to you. It's, mm -hmm. your, it's your personal tasting notes. And if I tell you that I think it smells like Christmas cake mm -hmm. and then you're thinking of Christmas cake, then it's, it's very, very influential to... Yeah. The thing is with uh, the, that Christmas flavour with um, is very strong with the, with the factors. I think I had a few of the actually older expressions mm -hmm. and there's a a lot of Christmas flavors yeah. going on with the with them you sometimes also get in the older ones particularly the older family casks you get much more into that kind of tobacco leather kind of direction mm. because we are talking about 50 60 year old first fill sherry casks so mm, yeah. I mean the power that they have is pretty exceptional yeah it is um, so you have a when when you look at uh, the the bottles um, that name Glen Farkler as, as as a logo that is uh, pretty pretty unique. So so how did you come with and and how long did you have that? So there's been a version of this logo for quite a few years already. Um, the original version, which is a slightly adapted version of what we currently use, is actually Old George's handwriting. So. <laughs> the way they were taught to write properly back in the day, which nowadays, unfortunately, since everyone uses their computers and phones and iPads <laughs> rather than actually writing the old fashioned way doesn't really exist anymore. But the kind of the old curse of handwriting they would have used, um, it has been slightly adapted because it was always too old fashioned. Um, in particular, mm -hmm. the letter R didn't look like what most of us recognize as a letter R nowadays. And so it was neatened up and straightened up a little bit, but mm -hmm. it's absolutely based on his handwriting. And that's how we believe things should be done here at Glenfarclas. You don't pay a marketing agency a million pounds to come up with a logo. <laughs> you use the old man's handwriting and it stands out on the shelf because everyone else uses the same agencies to make their logos and so they don't look so so different on the shelf. So um, the the old George was, the, was uh, George uh, S. George S. Grant. S. George S. Grant who was in the 50s and he was the one that went from blending to the single malt. Exactly. So over the course of those years, the the demand, I mean, whiskey is always something that comes and goes. There's always mm -hmm. cycles, always increases in demand. But the problem we have, of course, is it's a long term game. So mm -hmm. it takes us a long time to realize that the demand's there and then to react by increasing our production. But by the time we've done that, because we're working a few years in the future, I mean, in the 50s and 60s, maybe it was only a couple of the whiskies might have been five years old or seven years old, not mm -hmm. as old as they are today. But still, there is that time delay. And by the time you catch up, it's always too late quite often. Hopefully we're not in that case at the moment, but <laughs> we'll see because there's certainly been massive increases in production um, at lots of distilleries and of course so many new distilleries being built, although most of those are small. Um, so it, back in the 50s and 60s that happened, there was one of these decreases in demand and we were very lucky that as an independent company, um, George took the decision to say no, we're going to keep producing as we are, we'll just keep more of it ourselves in casks, we'll use it one day. <laughs> and that's what's allowed us to, to have the family casks in particular with 
brought us right back to 19, originally 1952 and three, although those unfortunately no longer exist. The oldest family cask you can buy now is 1954, but that's still, well, not quite 65 years old because it wasn't bottled this year. Um, it's been bottled yeah. a couple of years already. The most recent 1954, but certainly 60-ish years old. So. Okay, really, Depending really, on the release. <laughs> really nice background story. I see a bit of similarities to our business as we are also family business. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, 21 year old, it's getting older now. It, we're getting a little bit older. Um, we are lucky, of course, to have 21, 25, even 30 and 40 available. Um, although, of course, the 30 and 40 are not maybe in the quantities that um, they were a few years ago. This is my personal favourite. Mm -hmm. So I love the 21. For me, this is the point where you get the best balance between the increasing complexity with age, mm -hmm. but still the delicate style. So it's not too uh, overwhelmingly powerful. You're starting to get a little bit more influ influence from the wood, but it doesn't taste too woody. And you're getting something mm -hmm. which is really balanced. Mm -hmm. Of course, 21, again, it becomes much more optional. Do you add water or not? Because the finish will get shorter if you add a bit of water, which maybe you don't want to do on a whiskey of this age. Mm-hmm. Yes. And personally, I feel that nowadays, the, the industry, the way things have gone, we almost are a bit too complacent. We say, oh, yeah, it's a 21-year-old. <laughs> and we don't really take that seriously enough almost anymore. Mm, yeah, it's 21, 21 is, is, like, is before the next millennium, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. So if you <laughs> it's think... 1998, 98, it? probably 98. This was, this was maybe been bottled a few months, so let's say the whiskey's from 98, maybe a little bit um, 97, 96 as well. You mm. know, think how much the world has changed while we've been sitting on this whiskey. Mm -hmm. My favourite example is a mobile phone. Mm, mobile phone, yeah. yeah. Mobile phones are... I just about had one at that time. But it, it <laughs> yeah, made but it was, calls it was and texts. Just for calls and texts. Yeah. yeah. The screen was three centimetres mm. by one centimetre, I think. <laughs> but it, it, they lasted a week. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have to charge them every day, that's for sure. Mm. Cheers. Mm. Yeah, you get much more depth in this. Mm. Mm. Wow, it's it's richness, yeah. Um, but it's not overwhelming richness. It's a, uh, and this is going a bit more into the Christmas character that I was getting mentioning towards earlier. that direction, yeah. Bit of a mm, orange dusty and mm, bit of a cinnamon going on. Mm, I like it. I like it. Yeah, twenty one is is a good age for for a Scotch whiskey. Absolutely. <laughs> mm hmm. I mean, there is a big argument. Obviously, you can go much older, but it depends whether if you like it as it gets older. It depends on your taste. But I think most people mm -hmm. will like this. Mm -hmm. Very few people who like if they like whiskey at all would say, "Oh no, I don't like that." Okay. I think it's it becomes much more subjective as it gets older. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, as it, as it gets older, it also becomes much more a status symbol as well. If you can afford <laughs> to buy the ones that are older. Mm -hmm. But what we, we pride ourselves also at Glenfarclas is that our 21, 25 remain drinkable whiskies. Mm -hmm. They're whiskies that if you buy them, you should be taking them home, opening the bottle and drinking it, not putting it on the shelf and saying, maybe one day when my firstborn son <laughs> gets married and, you know, that's the day I'm going to open that bottle. It, it is still, still priceless so to be drunk, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. I like it. But you do realize it's a very delicate mm. spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it what, what the the Glenfarclas brand represents, like the the family traditional that you always go with the the age statement. Except for the hundred and five. So yes. so what's the story behind the hundred and five? Well, there's, there's a there's a big break between normal age statement and and then the hundred and five. Well, the actual story behind, behind the original product, so, so 105 was bottled for the first time back in 1968. 
Mm -hmm. So last year we actually celebrated the 50th birthday of this product. Okay. Now there are not many products still available today which are, I mean there have been tweaks of course, it's not the identical product as to what they would have been producing in 1968, mm -hmm. but the, there is a clear, clear line in um, what we've been doing. So 105 is actually re represents the proof mm -hmm. in the old British proof system. Mm -hmm. So we don't use that anymore. I'm, believe it or not, already too young to really understand what British <laughs> proof really meant. But what I do know is that 105 proof was 60% alcohol by volume in today's mm -hmm. uh, measurements. And like an American proof for it would have been 120. Mm -hmm. So of course it's, it's not the same system. We were talking earlier um, in the filling store about the number of litres in a cask, same as gallons back in the day, <laughs> were not the same between America and, and here. Um, but 105, back in 1968, George filled a cask into bottles to give to his friends and family at Christmas. And you've got to think that back then, what people were drinking was not single malt whiskey that was 10, 15, 21 mm -hmm. years old the vast majority of whiskey being produced was blended and it would have been regular 40% strength, which mm -hmm. I believe in the old strength was, I want to say 65 proof. Se no, I think it was 70. Anyway, uh, there is a calculation, but mm -hmm. I'm not good enough at maths. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he filled, he filled these bottles, he gave them to friends and family, and when he tried them, they said, this is so much more interesting than the stuff that we can drink in the pubs. Why aren't you selling this? And of course, his response was, OK, then. <laughs> and so the next time they bottled the cask, they sold it. And it was checked the strength as 105 proof. So the product was known as 105. And today it's one of our most famous products. It has something of a cult following. Mm -hmm. So look, because, of course, it's all sherry matured, like all the rest of the range, but to have the sherry power and the strength power in alcohol, it is a little bit younger. Um, it is the only permanent Glenfarclas that doesn't have an age statement on it. It used to, it used to be a 10 year old. However, courtesy of global warming, it no longer does. Because what we've discovered is that in the warehouses, it doesn't get as cold as it used to in the winter. Ooh, okay. And so we're losing a little bit more alcohol. So they discovered when they were putting together the casks, because the hard thing about 105 is it's a cask strength, which is always the same strength, which seems to be almost like an oxymoron. How can it be the same strength all the time if it's cask strength? Oh, you just so have to find the right cask, huh? Exactly. So it's a big game. So 10, 15 and 21, it's quite simple. You take first, second, third, fourth fill in the right Mm -hmm. percentages, you put them all together, you test it and then you maybe add a little bit of something or something else to, to make sure you have the same flavour each time, colour um, and style. But with 105 all that has to happen too, plus the strength. Oh my god, that's really tough to do, right? Yeah, and what they realised was that more often than they would have liked, not all the casks of 10 year olds were the right strength. Uh -huh. And so they were forced to go a little bit younger. It's not much younger, but some of it will be just slightly under 10 years old. So, so by law, of course, we had to take the age statement off it when we started to do that. Oh, OK. Um, so yes, we don't get as much snow as we used to up here in Ballandalich. So this was one of the one of the effects that's had, along with the effect on the water. OK, let's try it. Let's try it, absolutely. Of course, the water is even more important on something of this strength. I just find it, the first nose of this is so much toffee. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, almost the danger of 105 is, certainly on the nose, you wouldn't guess its strength. Mm -hmm. But I love, love the idea that, uh, okay, it's a, a cask strength exactly with 60% uh, uh, ABV. Well, between you and me, you're allowed a little bit of tolerance. So, <laughs> <laughs> when it says 60% in the bottle, it can actually be a little bit more or a little bit less. Yeah, so it sure, gives us a little bit of leeway, but it's still hard. Don't but get me wrong. Is there is there one guy with like, oh, this is a really high barrel, like put in a bit more, or is it, is it like <laughs> it can almost get to that? Yeah, so it, it can almost get to the stage where if they've got a batch pretty much ready to go, they'll test the strength and they'll say, okay, it's actually too strong. Um, find a few weaker casks to put in, or the other way around. Okay. 
Mm, okay. it just yes, it adds an extra level of complexity when it comes to putting the whiskies together for bottling. <laughs> Do you have extra extra people for that? Or <laughs> <laughs> is it like like oh no, it's that time of the year again? <laughs> oh, not we're one hundred five to be bottled. <laughs> no, all these things here because it is such a small team. You know, we don't have uh, a massive team of master distillers and master blenders and everything else. So, um, final word when it comes to these things is, is more often than not our distillery manager, Callum Fraser. Mm -hmm. So he'll have the final word on any of them as to whether he's happy that strength and mm -hmm. color and um, flavor and smell, everything is right from, from one bottling to the next. Okay, can I have a bit of water in there? Yes, I would absolutely recommend it in this one. Okay. Let me know how you get on with that. Sometimes it does take a little bit, bit of time, sometimes it takes a little bit more, it just depends on how you usually drink it. Yeah, 60 is... 60 is a lot. 60 is a bit over my limit. And I find as well that when you first put the water in, generally speaking, that's when you get the first power of alcohol. You have to let it breathe mm. and break it down a bit. Mm -hmm. I always tell people at tastings and so on, you know, you're looking for that prickly feeling here in your nose. If you've got that, that needs more water or more time. Oh, okay. Because as, as soon as you can smell alcohol, then alcohol is hiding something else in there you should be able to smell in, in mm -hmm. the more natural aromas. Well, alcohol is natural too, don't get me wrong. It's got the power, it's got the spice. Mm -hmm. I think it has less sweetness in the palate than it does in the nose. Mm -hmm. I was about to say I, I have a more sweetness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's subjective. Mm. Mm. I do like it. What you said with toffee that that really mm. really hit me in the in the taste as well. Maybe we don't have the same amount of water in as well, which will make mm -hmm. a difference. Mm hmm. Mm. Mm. I like it. Mm. Still got enough cake. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. A bit of chocolate with this would be nice as well. Mm -hmm. As someone who lived in Switzerland, it's my two favourite things in the world <laughs> to put together, whiskey and chocolate. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm. I love it. Nice range of bottles, very nice distillery. And I, lo I always love that whiskey is always so unique. As in the final product is unique, where you have unique smells and complexity and everything. And all the distilleries, you go to a distillery and there's always a story behind that. Absolutely. And there's always something to find out. You're doing this different and um, you're doing, not doing barcodes or something like that. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I really do love what you're doing here. So thank you very much for having us My here. My pleasure. And yeah, thank you very much for watching this video. If you found this video interesting, then please feel free to share it with your friends. And see you next time.